Hello, and welcome to this episode of Kidneys in the Kitchen. I'm your host, Melissa Prest, a registered dietitian with the National Kidney Foundation of Illinois. And with me today is a registered dietitian, Megan Gutierrez, who is also a transplant dietitian with Northwestern. Is that right? Yes. Yes. Excellent. I got that right. Um, so today we're going to be talking all about slow cooking um, and using a, a slow cooker. So we have a small one here um, today. They come in a few different sizes, uh, but we're going to be kind of talking about all things slow cooking. So sounds great. So thanks for being here, Megan. Thanks for having me. Anything you'd like to share about yourself with the, um, with the viewers? Oh, well, I've been at Northwestern for a little bit of four years now, and I work in the transplant department. So I've been working with all, all stages of chronic kidney disease, patients on dialysis, and then those who are also needing a transplant. Excellent. Yeah. So we did bring in um, two dishes already prepared, and we'll kind of talk through those yeah. recipes. So those are in the front. Um, we have a uh, a slow cooked oatmeal and then we also did a curry chickpea stew with couscous. Yes, very and hearty. They are and Megan picked the recipe so do you want to talk a little bit about why you picked the recipes you chose today? Yes, so I chose this um, hearty curry chickpea stew because it's vegetarian friendly and a lot of times um, patients need to restrict some protein either before their transplants um, leading up to dialysis. So this has like a prior low moderate amount of protein in there, but also highlighting the use of legumes and uh, a variety of vegetables that patients often tell me, oh, I can't have that. But here we're um, highlighting how to use this and how it fits in your renal diet because it can be part of a healthy diet um, in, the right, in the right quantities. Excellent. Yes. And then the oatmeal. And the oatmeal um, is one of my personal favorites, hearty for the winter months as we are in right now, but also just um, very satisfying to have in the morning, um, really complex carbohydrates to kind of keep your blood sugar stable throughout the day. Um, you don't get the hunger pains like an hour or two later after eating an oatmeal. Um, but then also the least processed oatmeal that we could possibly have is steel cut oats and um, showing you how to make this today in your slow cooker is probably the best way to cook steel cut oats because they take a little bit more time than regular um, instant or quick cooking oats do. So. And I know when I went to the store to get some of the ingredients for today, they had some quick cooked steel cut oats mm -hmm. and then we had the regular ones. So that was right. kind of a, you know, when you are cooking with them, you wanna make sure you get the right one because there are some that are, you know, the quick cook. Um, variety. Right, which cooking times will vary for that, um, of course. So you do want to choose the one that is just the regular steel cut oats, um, not the quick cooking variety for this recipe. Right. And I think that there's, you know, a lot of benefits with using a slow cooker, especially for patients when they're, you know, have a lot of doctor's appointments. I know transplant, they might, mm -hmm. you know, be at the transplant center all day to see a, a few yes. different physicians. Um, you have our dialysis patients who, you know, are, are on treatment three times a week for, you know, three, four hours mm -hmm. each time. Mm -hmm. um, and there's some fatigue going home afterwards or not wanting to cook. So I think that's some of the, of the benefits of using a slow cooker. Absolutely. When patients don't have the time, they tell me, or they're just too tired to get home from a long day, especially um, after coming home from dialysis, they're really too tired. Using a slow cooker is a great way to get a home cooked meal on the table and ready to eat when you um, get home from like a busy day. Yeah. So it's really easy to prepare the ingredients ahead of time before you leave the house or, or even um, the night before and then just throw it in the slow cooker uh, before you step out and then you have your meal ready to go. Yeah, and even if, you know, I know some people might be concerned about leaving a slow cooker, um, you know, on when they're not home, so it's another benefit. You can always make something when you are home, put it in the refrigerator and then heat it up when you when you get home as Absolutely. well. Absolutely. You could also use this to cook overnight while you're sleeping, such as this um, oatmeal recipe that we'll show you today. Yeah, which is what I did last night. That's I wonderful. cooked them overnight. So I have a smaller crock pot here, a slow cooker, I should say, sorry. Um, so this is a slower one, um, slower one, smaller Small. one. Small. <laughs> It's slow. <laughs> it's small and slow, kind of like me. Um, and so 
there's very a variety of sizes. Yes. So there, this is probably one that would serve, you know, two people really well, maybe up to four. And then, you know, we have a few other sizes um, available to us. So what size, you know, do you normally, I guess, would you use or? Right. So for me personally, I like to cook a big quantity of food and I like to have leftovers and repurpose those leftover leftovers or even just um, freeze them for later use as well. So uh, a good size uh, for leftovers would be a maybe five to seven quart size slow cooker and that can feed like five or more people easily. Um, but if you are cooking for one or you have maybe four or less people in your household, a uh, good size would be four quarts. Mm -hmm. And they're also come like a little itty bitty crock pots or yep. slow cookers where you um, could heat up dips and sauces and yeah. things like that too. Yeah, and then I actually have like a, a lunch one. So then I like yeah. bring it and I heat things up in the office and I love it. So um, yeah, so that's always, there's always different sizes. And there's always a few like considerations to, to do when you are doing some slow cooking. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, sometimes things like if you're opening up the lid or closing it back, that can alter cooking times. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you might, if you're doing things with, um, so for instance, in the the chickpea stew one, you know, the recipe had a couple different steps. And yes. so the final steps in it was putting in things that could get more mushy if they were cooked too long. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So um, that's something else to kind of consider. Um, what other things, you know, do you so, think uh, about? Also considering the filling the slow cooker up with um, the right amount of ingredients and the right amount of liquids as well. So you don't want to go too low, but you also don't want to go too high either. So at least a good rule of thumb is at least halfway full of the ingredients, but nothing more than two thirds way full. Yeah, because then you have an issue trying to get right. it all cooked right, and right. the cooking times. Um, and then lifting and, you know, taking off the lid and things will alter, alter, I'm sorry, also alter the cooking times. Mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. I think every time you take off the lid, it's, it adds maybe like 10 more minutes, right. roughly of cooking time um, to it. So that's, you know, something else. Absolutely. Then also when you're cooking in the slow cooker, um, you get some condensation that forms at the top of the lid and that water falls into your your meal, um, often maybe diluting flavors or so. So you definitely want to season your ingredients well with like some, you know, salt-free seasonings, herbs, spices. Um, but I also like to save the fresh herbs for last or at the mm -hmm. end stages of cooking because those flavors in the fresh herbs can easily diminish or just kind of lose their potency when they're simmering for long hours. So some fresh basil, some fresh parsley or cilantro, like in this recipe we have today for the stew, is good to uh, add at the end stages of cooking. And then, you know, sometimes I think people might throw in like frozen meats or things like that mm -hmm. in, a, in a slow cooker and really they shouldn't be shouldn't be doing that for food safety. Right. Food safety concerns are hugely important. Um, so you want to fully thaw out your meats before adding them to the slow cooker, but also large chunks of meat or big, you know, roasts um, in the slow cooker wouldn't be your best option either. Mm -hmm. So you, you um, want to have pretty uniform pieces so they cook evenly um, so that not every recipe is appropriate for the slow cooker either. Right. Right. And then there's a few other things, you know, kind of considerations with the slow cooker, thinking about, um, you know, by having it in kind of that cooking for so long, you might have an increase in flavors that are maybe more pungent or a mm -hmm. decrease in other ones. So sometimes that's where like adjusting the recipe, um, you know, or at least if it's not a recipe already made for a slow cook, you might have to do a little bit of an adjustment right. to it. Right. Yeah or even cooking times you should adjust as well. I mean, some the recipes that we have today have suggested cooking times and whatnot, but adapting that for the size of your slow cooker or um, adapting the spices around the size as well. Right. Anything else that we should share before we show these recipes? And Well, um, another thing to consider is adding dairy to the slow cooker. So uh, milks and cheese and creams. Those typically want to be added towards the end of cooking, like maybe within the last hour or so. And then also you want to add like those mushy vegetables like mm -hmm. Melissa was talking about earlier in the recipe that we're going to show you. Maybe the zucchini or the fresh tomatoes, maybe the fresh green peas you want to add, um, I'm sorry, the frozen green peas. 
add towards the end stages of cooking as well so they don't get too mushy and just um, lose their texture. Right. Well, great. Well, let's look at, it doesn't, it doesn't look very pretty, but if Megan wants to pull the oatmeal, you can do that or so we'll yes. look overhead. So it doesn't look pretty. I apologize. It's probably not like, oh, what is that? But this is a overnight slow cooked oatmeal. Mm -hmm. um, really easy to, to put together. Um, I don't know if you remember, do you remember the recipe? Yes, the okay. recipe is um, com combining the steel cut oats with applesauce with um, vanilla unsweetened almond milk and water, a mixture of those two liquids. And then for flavoring, you could add cinnamon, fresh nutmeg, or even a little bit of vanilla extract as well to give that nice sweet taste. Yeah, and I did a little bit of the cinnamon in that, so it mm -hmm. has like a little bit of that brownish color is um, mm -hmm. from the cinnamon. Um, and the applesauce is in, you know, really to kind of help replace some of that sweetness that you might have from brown sugar or cinnamon, um, you know, something right. like that. Um, but I think the nice thing with oatmeal is you can kind of adjust the seasonings just kind of based on taste. Absolutely. And using the fresh or the whole fruits themselves as a way to sweeten the oatmeal is a nice this is a good way to showcase that because you don't have to use added sugars like so many people are just accustomed to yeah yeah which i do a lot in my like oatmeal mm -hmm. like a plain oatmeal and then add in some i mean sorry yogurt and then <laughs> add in some fruit <laughs> right fruit for sweetener fruit for sweetener not the not that so and, and then with this too the really easy thing is you just kind of take all the ingredients you know measure them mm -hmm. you put them in the um, slow cooker you just mix them put it on and you know yeah. on low it could be low would be longer cooking times so you could do high for shorter right um but yeah it was you know pretty Pretty right. easy. What was the smell like waking up to this oatmeal this morning? Amazing. <laughs> Wasn't it? It was so great. <laughs> and you're like rolling out of bed, don't have like, to think yeah, about it. I know, like oatmeal's yeah. done. So it was really it was really easy. easy. So let's look at the stew. So we'll kind of take a look at this and then I'm going to pull up um, the recipe for this so you can kind of take a look. So this is a really hearty um, chickpea curried stew and we did it with the side of couscous but you can do other grain type sides with mm -hmm. it as well. It doesn't have yeah. to be the couscous. And that's another point too to be made. This recipe didn't call for the couscous or um, any rice to be made with the stew. Um, it suggested to serve this over the the grains themselves which um, could take away the texture, the look, the, the flavor of the stew itself. Um, so that's another thing to consider with your slow cooker. It's You can easily add any grain to it to make it more hearty, um, cook it separately, and then pour the stew over. So we're going to take a look at the recipe for this. There we go. Um, so this was the original recipe, or like slightly altered. I think you found a recipe and then um, Megan had altered it just a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, and you'll kind of pay attention and that the top part where it talks about the nutrition and you'll notice, you know, it has a thousand milligrams of potassium and then 380 milligrams of sodium, which isn't bad. Um, we have 190 milligrams of phosphorus, but 12 grams of protein, 11 grams of fiber. Mm -hmm. So if you are someone that's maybe post-transplant mm -hmm. or earlier stages of CKD, this recipe as written would be appropriate. Would be appropriate. Absolutely. You know, completely fine. You know, you know, you're probably going to be in a higher potassium or not a potassium restriction. Um, you know, we know in general, lots of potassium mm -hmm. is great for controlling blood pressure. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, obviously lots of fruits and vegetables are good for overall right. health. Right. Um, so it's a great recipe as written. And then what we did is we kind of wanted to go in and modify it a little bit for... Um, you know, someone that maybe is on dialysis with a more flexible potassium or uh, maybe in the later stages of, of CKD before dialysis and need to watch potassium a little bit. Mm -hmm. So then we, we went on here, and I'm sorry, the nutrition facts is a little bit slow to, a little bit low, uh, small to see, but the potassium, we went from 1,000 milligrams to 480, mm -hmm. and then I think the, um, the phosphorus went down to about 100 and... 100 milligrams. So we, we had decreased some of that. The protein went down a little bit, so it was about 5 grams of, of protein. So obviously it's mm -hmm. not going to be a... 
and the calories went down a little bit too, but a part of it, you know, if we're kind of cutting back on some of the higher potassium foods, you know, you might have a little less of the, the protein and things as right. well with that because there is some protein and yes i think there was vegetables. a the main cut came from the the chickpeas themselves um our protein high phosphorus high potassium foods right. however eaten in the appropriate quantity quantities like we were discussing earlier can still be a part of your um, healthy renal diet yes and so um so for instance like the onion so in the original recipe i think it called for three medium onions now we know onions themselves you know you mm -hmm. could have onions in your food not a problem mm -hmm. but then we kind of think about that quantity of mm -hmm. um the even a lower potassium food and controlling for that so um, one of the changes was to reduce the amount of onions which if you're someone that's maybe not a huge fan of onions that's totally fine yes mm -hmm. <laughs> they add flavor they, they <laughs> just do. one onion at a time they do no. <laughs> um, so cut that. And then the other thing that was a really big change um, was we went from using the original recipe had about a 28 ounce can of chopped tomatoes in yes. it. Um, and so, you know, taking that out, but switching to just some tomato paste and water to give mm -hmm. some of that tomato flavor mm -hmm. without all of the potassium. So that was also done. Um, the tomatoes in the original recipe were kind of used to take the brown bits from the... Right from the, you know, the sauteing before you add things to the, the slow cooker. So that was, you know, part of like kind of taking all those up. But if you do a little bit of the tomato paste and water, mm -hmm. you have the same effect. Um, and then also, you know, decrease just the quantity of carrots, um, you know, down to one cup, decrease the peas down to one cup, um, decrease cauliflower down to two cups, and then added in some zucchini and celery for, you know, trying to replace some of these vegetable cuts we're making to make it hearty, right. um, but also keeping the potassium low. So um, just kind of a really good example of, you know, taking that recipe, mm -hmm. you know, that you might find, and then you, you're able to modify that and still have those foods that maybe you thought, I can't eat this. Right, absolutely. You would look at this recipe and you're like, oh, I see tomatoes, crushed tomatoes on the ingredients list. I can't have that. Yeah. Or that seems like a lot of chickpeas. I'm not sure if I can have that many chickpeas. So there are ways to adapt recipes. There are ways to um, ask, bring a recipe to your dietitian and, and refer um, to them and seeing ways that this can still fit within your, within your diet and within your lifestyle as well. And so, do you want to talk through a little bit about how the recipe was, was made? Yes. Um, I like this recipe for a variety of reasons. Um, the, the curry powder the, itself is the flavor in here. And you, you can get a lot of different types of curry powders, but most of them should be un unsalted. So um, you can add flavor by using those types of dried seasonings. But to start with the recipe, this isn't quite the one pot dish that you would yeah. hope uh, a slow cooker recipe would provide you like the the oatmeal would would later however you do start sauteing the vegetables first and sauteing the vegetables in olive oil um, the onions the garlic some of that tomato paste um, along with the curry powder releases a lot of the flavor in the curry powder itself mm -hmm. so you get um, nice sauteed vegetables with the spice and then um, like the brown bits that you were discussing earlier um, with the original recipe had provided to scrape up with uh, the crushed tomatoes, you can still get flavor, those brown bits, right. very flavorful, <laughs> and incorporate that into this modified um, version. So once you do that, you add that to the slow cooker and then um, layer in more of the vegetables on top and then finish it off with the vegetable broth or the chicken broth, however yeah. you'd like. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then with the beans, um, we used the dried beans, which I have the, the bag there, but we used dried versus mm -hmm. the canned. Not that there's anything wrong with mm -hmm. using the canned, but um, you know we went with the, the dried beans. So for those, there's a little bit of an extra step when you are using dried beans. Um, you mm -hmm. generally want to like soak them, um, you know, so you want to talk a little bit more about that? Right. So dried beans in general, except for the use of like lentils, do require an overnight soak, typically about eight hours overnight. Um, and that is just to kind of start the cooking process or tenderize them a little bit more. If you would buy the canned chickpeas, um, totally fine as well, but maybe you would use a uh, cut back on the cooking time mm -hmm. in the slow cooker. So 
um, either or, but the dried beans themselves don't have anything added to them. There's no added salt or whatever you have to watch out for. So that is a, a nice wholesome way to kind of incorporate more protein and um, good phosphor or good good amount of fiber in your diet as well. Yeah, and then this recipe in particular, there was no added salt. I mean, there's a little bit in the low-sodium mm -hmm. chicken broth, but there was no other added salt in this. Right. So the flavor is still there yes. with all of the vegetables and curry powders and tomatoes that you have. Yep. Mm -hmm. And then the last part of the recipe was really just adding in those softer, mushy vegetables. So at the very end, mm -hmm. um, after everything had cooked for about... Eight, 10 hours, um, then added in the cauliflower, and I added in the zucchini, mm -hmm. um, and you cook for another like 15-ish minutes until it's it's done, and and then you garnish with a little bit of cilantro. You can mix in some cilantro mm -hmm. leaves with that, and um, you have a pretty hearty, wintry stew. Absolutely, and one that freezes well too for, for leftovers. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. So anything else you want to add about slow cooking, or your favorite things about it, or that we haven't discussed yet. Well, I mean, <laughs> slow cooking is not just for the winter months either, you know? It's an easy thing to pull out in the summer when you don't want to heat up your oven or your stovetop or just kind of walk away from a dish and yep. then come back to it. So these are great tools to kind of keep all year round. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you, Megan. And yes. these smell delicious in here. <laughs> <laughs> We're hungry. It's lunchtime. <laughs> We're like, oh, this smells so good. Yes. Um, but thank you for all your tips yeah. and picking these amazing recipes. I had fun making them. And yeah. Thanks. It's great having me. Thank you. And until next time, we will see you later.